Welcome to GV247.TV, the Global Vision Channel. A non-profit web TV channel bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. Hello and welcome to the weekend show on Global Vision TV at GV247.TV. And I have to say, we're coming from sunny Scotland, sunny, summery Scotland. Yeah. So if you're new to the programme, my name is Deborah Menelaws and with me today is my husband, Stuart. Now, I say that as though you're not with me every time, but there are times that occasionally you're not. But we're a couple. And as always, we want to say a big thank you to our new subscribers. And if you haven't already joined do click the yellow subscribe box below. And if you're watching this on YouTube, can I suggest that you go directly to the network at globalvision.tv. This week, we continue our series into what is church and how does church work out in real life? Now, we've had a great response to this series. And as I have said in the last couple of weeks, it's from those of you in larger churches and especially those in small or house churches, as we used to call them. Yeah. Although, as most of you will know by now, that is exactly where the first churches met. As one of the ladies said in our online fellowship last week, the church is the people, not the building. And I know most of you know that. So, Stuart, what are we looking at this week? Well, just to repeat what we've said previously, if you're not uh, if you've not seen the earlier programs in the series, this is program 103, and you're really best to start at episode 89, called the Berean Omitting the Crown of Life Testimony Programs, and on to this episode, because each program builds upon a foundation. So let's remind ourselves again of that opening scripture uh, from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Number one, they devoted themselves to being taught. Number two, they devoted themselves to fellowship. Number three, they broke bread together. Number four, they prayed together. Number five, they were filled with awe as the Lord touched lives. Mm -hmm. And that's our programme today. And number six, they were together and had everything in common. Number seven, they gave sacrificially to whoever had need. And number eight, they met every day at the temple. Number nine, they met in their homes to break bread and ate together. Ten, they had glad and sincere hearts. Number eleven, they praised God together. Number twelve, they enjoyed the favour of the people. I'm looking forward to doing the glad and sincere heart, Stuart. I don't know how we're going to do that one, but today we're looking at the fifth item on the list, as Stuart said, which is verse 43, I think, of Acts 2. Um, it says, Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Now, we often read sentences like this in the Bible and don't stop to really take in what it's saying. And I feel this is a, a very important one. Now, unfortunately, we hear of many Bible-believing Christians who are feeling low in these days. And I'm afraid that's the way it is as we live in a fallen world, which is fast approaching the time of the coming kingdom and the Lord's return. But it can be a struggle to be upbeat as the world impinges on us with all its darkness, its toil and strife. And of course, as it has entered the church to such a degree that it's become very difficult to find a Bible-believing church. And it's even more difficult for those on their own to feel encouraged. The scripture we're looking at, which I said is Acts 2 verse 43, says that they were filled with awe. Now other translations say, say uh, for example, and all came upon every soul and many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. However, it's interesting because the various King's, King James versions use the word fear instead of awe. And in Greek, uh, the word is phobos, which does literally mean fear. So we can get a clear picture that this was no small event. In Mark 16, 20, whilst Jesus was still on the earth, it says, they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by accompanying signs. And that's actually very important because the signs and wonders followed the preaching of the word. They should never be sought for their own sakes. And I know this is a point you really wanted to stress, Stuart, isn't it? Mm. So how do the apostles get this power to do the signs and wonders? 
And are they still for today? I think that's really what we're going to look at. So mm -hmm. where do you want to start? Well, rather than reinvent the wheel, so to speak, let's take a look at the overview teaching in episode eight from the discipleship checklist, mm -hmm. uh, which is channel three in the lineup. And uh, I start this piece by referring to the previous episode, checklist number seven, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Gifts of the Holy Spirit, prevailing views. Last week we looked at the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we clearly understood from God's word that he, the Holy Spirit, will indwell those who turn to Christ and seek to follow him. In Ephesians 1, 13 through to 14, we learned that we are sealed. The Spirit is a deposit given that guarantees our inheritance. And the Gospel of John, chapter 16, we understand why we need the Holy Spirit operating in our lives. Yet we must fully understand that our prayers and petitions are always to the Father. Matthew 6, 9, through Christ Jesus, John 16, 23. There are Christian denominations that shy away from this subject, either because of a lack of understanding or perhaps in a bid to keep spiritual abuses far from the flock that are tragically prevalent today and indeed are an end time sign. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through to 12. There are others still who would say that the spiritual giftings ended once the original apostles went to be with the Lord. Before we look at this subject, it's important to understand that the Bible teaches us that we have to be alert because we have a spiritual adversary, Satan, and he is actively seeking to devour. 1 Peter 5, 8. In Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20, we are told that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. Now, you said, Stuart, in that clip that some churches don't want to tackle this subject as they work to protect their flocks from potential spiritual abuses. Now, that was your mm. words. Now, you and I know a lot about that subject, unfortunately. Mm. We've seen and experienced what is known as the Toronto Blessing in the early 90s, where another spirit definitely was at work. Now, as you know, I personally believe that this was the start of the end time, a sifting as we see who is actually following the Lord and who is following man, particularly those who bring the signs and wonders. And it, it was ever thus. Now, there has been such an exponential increase in this over the years, which has brought us to where we are right now, having to put this teaching online because there's been such a great falling away from biblical truth as prophesied. And so many Christians no longer have a gathering that they can join in with, which is really why you're sitting there. Mm. And yes, false signs and wonders is, of course, the most notable sign to beware of the Lord Jesus Christ and his disciples uh, they have much to say about that throughout the New Testament uh, on that subject. And we, of course, have, we've got so many films uh, that cover that topic. Uh, so do have a, a good look uh, through the rest of GV 24-7. But once again, let's uh, take a look at some of those warnings. And again, uh, from episode eight of the Discipleship Checklist. While we must fully understand that signs and wonders are not something we are to actively seek, Jesus Christ warns of those who actively prophesied, cast out demons and did many miracles in his name, but on the day of judgment will be rejected, Matthew 7, 22 through to 23. The Apostle Paul gives us a little more understanding on this when he writes regarding those who preach the gospel for false motives. Philippians 1.15 Now that's very interesting. Over the last few days I've been sharing posts on the Bethel Communications Facebook about a ministry who was encouraging people to prophesy by picking a number or a card from a lucky dip. And depending on what colour they picked, um, this would decide what they were going to do. Now this is a good example, what Stuart was saying, it's the abusing the, the gift of prophecy. Now I'll give you an example. So if you picked a red card, you were to give a prophetic word to the person on your left about their financial situation. By the way, uh, they actually advised this was best done in groups of six to eight. If you got a green one, you were to give a prophetic word to the person on your right about their relationship with someone close to them. 
If you've got blue, you were to give a prophetic word to the person opposite about something that concerns them. <laughs> this is nothing short of fortune telling, which is expressly forbidden by God. So Stuart, we need to take a look at what the gifts of the Spirit actually are. I'm sorry to say, but nothing really surprises me anymore regarding occult practices in the church. Uh, just when you think you've seen the worst, there's another one just around the corner. Uh, so, mm. as you say, uh, let's look at what the gifts are and why they've been given as we go back to the discipleship checklist. What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? The gifts of the Holy Spirit are quite simply the Lord himself working through the believer in Christ in accordance with his determination, Hebrews 2.4, for the equipping of the church, and they are listed in 1 Corinthians 12, 8-11. Should we make the error of thinking that we ourselves possess any special skills, we must remind ourselves that Christ Jesus made it clear that without him we can do nothing. John 15, 5. Now the giftings that are listed are the message of wisdom, the message of knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy. This is listed as one of particular note in 1 Corinthians 14, 1. The distinguishing of spirits, tongues, both earthly and heavenly. Interpretation of tongues. In the letter to the Romans, we see another list in Romans 12, 6 through to 8, prophesying. Serving, teaching, encouraging, contributing generously, diligent leadership, and showing mercy. It is very clear from the text that these spiritual gifts are given by God as he determines, Romans 12, 6 and 1 Corinthians 12, 11. The gifts are given for service and for the edification of the church. Under no circumstances should an individual seek spiritual powers for selfish reasons. We must never delude ourselves, such as Simon the sorcerer, who was a popular figure amongst the people, Acts 8, 9 through to 24, who desired power to further his reputation, even offering money. Without love for one another, all such spiritual powers are meaningless. We are indeed to eagerly desire spiritual gifting to be of service within the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians 14, 1. However, Isaiah 66, 2, we need to have a heart that is motivated by humility, contrition, and the fear of God, and seeking only the will of the Father for our service to him and his church. The greater gift, love, 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through to 13. If you were ever unsure of the purpose of gifting, it is when we read further in the letter to the Corinthians that we read about the greater gift, love. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through to 13, and Romans 12, 9. Now, love is patience. It is kindness. It does not envy, does not boast. It is not proud. It is not self-seeking, not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs does not delight in evil, rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, and never fails. The greatest gift is love. Love must be sincere, hate evil, cling to what is good, devotion to disciples, honour one another, never lack zeal, keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, and share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those that persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the sight of everyone. And if it is possible, live at peace with all. We see that love is the greatest gift, and it is the first commandment. Deuteronomy 6, 5 through to 9. God himself is love. 1 John 4, 8. Jesus said that we know his disciples because they love one another. John 13, 35. 
God appoints individuals, 1 Corinthians 12, 27 through to 31. Apostles, prophets, teachers. We have workers of miracles, gifts of healing, those able to help others, gifts of administration, different kinds of tongues. In Ephesians 4.11, we have evangelists and pastors. Do you eagerly desire gifting to be equipped for service and to serve the body of Christ? In particular, wherever the Lord has placed you. You know, sitting in a pew or a comfortable chair, letting others seek God so that they end up doing all the work is not an act of love. Jesus is looking for disciples, not spectators. The laying on of hands, Hebrews 6, 1 through to 3. As with all aspects of the supernatural, we come to a subject that raises concerns for many believers. In 1 Timothy 5.22, we see that he is instructed not to be quick to lay hands on any man, for we must be prayerful and measured whenever we seek to move forward in the Lord's service. What is it? We read that Jesus Christ healed the sick both by touch, Matthew 8.3, and where he was nowhere near the person, Matthew 8.13. In James 5.14, we read about the sick being anointed with oil by the elders of the church, but no actual laying on of hands is mentioned. We read about the laying on of hands in regard to the sending out of the disciples set apart for service, Acts 13.3 and 2 Timothy 1.6. In chapter 13 of Acts, we must also take note that they had all been worshipping the Lord and fasting, and it was the Holy Spirit who told them to set apart Barnabas and Saul, later to be called Paul, for church planting. The baptism of the Holy Spirit came upon people without any help from humans, Acts 2.4, and was also imparted by the laying on of hands from the apostles, Acts 8.17. Now note, In regard to those demon-possessed, Jesus did not touch them, but simply commanded or rebuked the spirits to leave, Matthew 17, 17. So we see from a careful reading of the examples given that we should always be focused on the Father and look to him for leading and guidance within a given situation. Spiritual warnings. Deceiving spirits, 1 Timothy 4.1, are a specific problem in the last days. This warning is from the Holy Spirit himself and not just an exhortation by Paul in his letter to train Timothy. 2 Corinthians 11.13-15 warns the body of Christ that there are people who claim to be workers of Christ, but they are deceitful workers. So, we're talking about the signs and wonders which were performed by those who had received power from on high. Now, we first of all saw that in John 20, 22, when Jesus breathed on his disciples and they received the Holy Spirit to enable them to go out and do the signs and wonders after they preached the gospel. But the actual baptism of the Holy Spirit, which Stuart referred to earlier, the immersion, in other words, did not happen until the Lord had ascended. For he had said that he didn't leave them as orphans in John 14, 18, but he would send the Holy Spirit. But they had to tarry, it's a good old word, tarry in Jerusalem. And so we see the famous event in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit descended on those who were gathered in the upper room at what we call Pentecost. But it was actually, it was the Jewish feast of Shavuot, the, the feast of weeks. So they're all gathered there and the Holy Spirit alighted on them like tongues of fire. Mm. So. And, and so and so we saw the start of the church and the basis uh, in verses 42 to 47 of the teaching uh, we're sharing here. Mm. How church is supposed to be. Now, the people were filled with awe, a healthy reverent fear when they saw the signs and wonders performed by the Lord through his servants, the apostles. Yeah. Now, here's my favourite bit coming up, Stuart, because we thought it would be a good idea to finish, to encourage ourselves that signs and wonders, the gifts of the Spirit, are still for today. So we're going to take an example of the real gift of the Holy Spirit at work, the gift of healing, which was preceded by a prophetic word, 
So that's two gifts at work, the gift of prophecy and the gift of healing. Now, this is from episode 87 of The Weekend Show, when I interviewed a dear sister called Pam, Pam McLemon. It's also featured on the Crown of Life series, which is the fourth channel. And if you go to episode 12, you can hear the whole testimony. And we hope this blesses you. Tell us about Ashley. Right, well, Ashley was born deaf. But we didn't know Ashley was deaf. That was she profoundly deaf? Yes, mm-hmm. Ashley was profoundly deaf. And we didn't pick up on this until uh, we were away a weekend and Ashley would be about three and a half or thereabouts. And we were shouting at her for some reason and she had her back to us and she wasn't responding. We thought, that's so strange. Um, so we turned her around and it was at this point we started to put stuff above her mouth mm. and we started to realise she can't hear and they, we hadn't picked it up any sooner because being twins, some of you might know, they developed this Google to Goop language yes. of their own. So they could communicate. So mm. there was no need um, for her to communicate because she had her, 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 her sister. Twin sister yeah. Yeah. So she um, was quickly taken to the GP. They referred her to an audiology uh, specialist, the Balvicker Centre in Glasgow, where she was diagnosed as profoundly deaf in one year and 90% if in the other year. They said that she may be able to hear a, a very high-pitched tone in that year, but no, she was deaf. You, you moved on to a Baptist church. Yes. It was in there that a gentleman approached me. I had been going maybe three or four weeks, mm-hmm. and I was approached by a, a dear friend, now he is, and he approached me and he just said, so, uh, do you have three children? And I said, yes. He said, which one is deaf? Mm-hmm. And I was quite, I was actually very sharp with them because mm-hmm. I was taken aback because I was still, we were still coming to terms with it. And I suppose you could say it was pride. Mm-hmm. That was why we didn't sort of tell everybody. Mm-hmm. And um, he says, which one is deaf? And I said, who told you? Mm-hmm. And he said, God told me. And I said, oh, did he? And it, I was quite, you know, mm-hmm. and I said, well, why would he tell you? And he said, well, one day I'll pray for her healing. Mm-hmm. And I just said, all oh, right. <laughs> because mm-hmm. this was new to me, mm-hmm. um, absolutely new to me. But it, it took me back to that walk that I had in the kitchen when I was crying out to the Lord. And I and I did say, and I remember saying, Lord, if you're the same yesterday, today and forever, why am I not seeing that? Mm-hmm. Why am I not seeing that? Mm-hmm. So here I was... Lord was taking me on a journey where I was going to see that. He was going to show me that. Yeah. So um, some months passed by and that gentleman came to our house and uh, it wasn't anything like you see on these television programmes, these healing meetings. And it was nothing like this. This mm-hmm. was one man came to the house and we prayed with my daughter and it was almost like he sat there, I sat here and she was stood in the middle and he simply put a wee bit of oil in his hands, held her ears, and he just looked at her and he said, Ashley, we're just going to invite Jesus to come and mm-hmm. heal your ears. And, and that's what he did. And he just prayed, Lord Jesus, we invite you to come and heal Ashley's ears. And her wee face went red and red. And she just kept going, Mum, 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 my ears, they're burning, they're burning. Mm-hmm. And it was instant. It was instant in front of me. Um, and I, and it was like wow and she you know we used to test her we used to take her in the car and we would like that and the other two wouldn't hear and she would be right in there mm-hmm. um, and to this day she would testify that she has hearing that is not normal mm-hmm. she hears she's a school teacher and she can hear at the other end of the classroom or the other end <laughs> of the corridor and they're like miss how can you hear that? And she'll say, because I've got a special healing. Oh. Um, so God didn't just heal her. That's wonderful. He didn't just heal her. It's just wonderful. But he's just gave her amazing healing. Mm-hmm. So that was the first encounter that I had, that he is the God of the miraculous. Mm-hmm. Next week, we're going to look at uh, topic number six. They were together and had everything in common. You know, it takes time, effort and energy to build relationships first with the Lord and uh, that should then outwork amongst his people. So I'd like to encourage you to watch the Lamplight Study Fellowship meetings as those believers have come together to learn and encourage each other in their precious faith 
all are from different backgrounds. Mm. There are those who are very knowledgeable and there are those who are just starting out. Mm -hmm. Yet over, you can see that over time of recording, mm -hmm. there's a there's been a growing bond of friendship and trust and that's developed as they search the scriptures together with humility. And I'd like to encourage you to do the same. Mm -hmm. it, it takes time, it takes humility to, to build relationships with people and help one another as you study the scriptures uh, together to get the instruction that our Heavenly Father wants us to know about. Yeah. It's submitting to one another in love, isn't it, Stuart? Yeah. And that's that's what we have Absolutely. to do. So I think it's, it's just a little conclusion we're, we're going to watch. Have the a little final, conclusion, uh, a wee clip. A wee clip. <laughs> a for a final wee clip. <laughs> okay. okay. So the conclusion. Do not allow just anyone to lay hands on you or even pray for you. Seeking the Lord for guidance and direction is biblical, as we can see with Paul and Barnabas, where the leadership placed hands on them. However, spending time earnestly in prayer before your Heavenly Father every day, reading carefully His Word, is the foundation of your relationship. So there we go. Remember, there's many films, as Stuart said, throughout Global Vision TV by a wide range of Bible teachers if you want to look into these topics in more detail. Of course, you can always drop us a line if you need any help. And remember, folks, as Stuart was saying, Monday is the Lamplight Fellowship study meeting, although you can join it any time, any day. Um, I think they're going to be on week 25 of if What is a Christian? It's just amazing. Remember, do, do get your little cards, folks. You know, if, you, you know, if you're somebody who evangelises or just, you know, if an accidental meeting with somebody, these little cards are very, very helpful to hand out to others so they can look up these things for themselves. Um, stay in touch. If you want anything clarified, get in touch. We'll be really happy to answer. And I think we need to go now. God bless. See you next week. Bye-bye just now. Bye. Bye. This is GV247.TV, bringing biblical perspective to the world in which you live. A powerful free resource with hundreds of short films on a wide range of Bible topics from experts around the world, plus full-length sermons and programs for teaching and encouragement. Choose from current affairs, signs of the times, a chance to voice your own opinion and special offers on our full-length feature films, documentaries and study materials. At over four hours in length, The Lamplight Project is a systematic 12-part Bible study series. A powerful teaching tool that begins with the origins of life and takes the viewer on a comprehensive journey packed with high-profile interviews, film, graphics and illustrations, concluding with the return of Christ and an encouragement to stand firm and be faithful. Complete with a free study guide download for both personal and group study, this powerful interactive guide connects to over a thousand programs with expert interviews on gv247.tv, our free service web TV channel. Does My Life Have Meaning? A powerful one-hour presentation produced from the Lamplight Project. With a free copy of the Gospel of Luke, this film is crammed with engaging interviews, film and graphics. A life-challenging film to those searching for answers. As distributors for the Jesus film, we offer this timeless movie based on Luke's Gospel. This clear presentation of the life of Jesus Christ has been viewed worldwide and translated into over 1,200 languages we provide the film with a free copy of the Gospel of Luke. The Daniel Project is a popular TV documentary that presents an overview of Bible prophecy and an encouragement to read the signs of the times. Hailed as one of the best TV films to be made on the subject, DVD extras feature a heart-to-heart -heart interview about the way of rescue. Based loosely on the documentary, The Daniel Connection is a full-length feature film. This fictional thriller incorporates many of the themes promoted through pop culture and social media which affect people on a global scale. 
Launched at the Cannes Film Festival, The Daniel Connection points the ever-skeptical viewer to search the Bible for answers to life's deepest questions. We've been serving the body of Christ for over 30 years, and if you would like further information, please do not hesitate to get in touch.